Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of A Voice in the Hollow. My name is Miguel Ortega and this is my co-host Tran Ma. Can't hear you at all. No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah there we there are. We go. How's everybody doing? Um, hold on one second. Ooh, we got a lot of people here already. Yeah, it's nice to have everyone here chatting. Yeah. So um, should I show something first? Let me show. Uh, yeah, just show where we're at, like in edit. Okay, so give me one second. Uh, let me just let this render real quick. And I'll show you guys. Miguel is going to um, share his screen in a second. There we are. Okay. So this week, we're just trying to wrap up the redoing of that first sequence. So um, well, let me just play some of the stuff. So just for those that don't know what we're doing, we're doing a, like a, an animated horror film. It's not really horror, but it is, I guess, uh, done entirely in Unreal 5. It's all in Swahili. Um, and let me just show you a few things. And it's a very tiny, small crew. It's Tran and I doing most of the visuals, and then um, we have two people helping us on animation, um, doing the motion motion capture cleanup. Everything was mo-capped. Um, yeah, let me just show you. There's just a small section. This is what we've been working on this week. So this is something we worked on. Did the motion capture for this this week. Oh, yeah, here. Nitakuwa ni Marusha kwa nguvu sana. Siuone kweli. So you can see one shot here that's going to be in black and white. It's because we don't have it finished yet. Next shot. old but yeah so that's what we've been doing so this has completely been redone uh just to show you like what this looked like before uh, not that everything here has been redone except for the animation but you can see this looks pretty crappy before uh which is always how we work like we constantly keep improving what we do yeah, and lighting was, um, go to the master shop, the K-Pit. Yeah, that one's changed a lot. Lighting is new to us in this uh, software. Unreal, yeah. <laughs> so, so we were struggling with the lighting, and then I was like, okay, I finally think I know how to do this, but it means I break everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for us to push the fog, like you can see, if you go back to the, the K-Pit shot, just so you can do before and after with the fog and lighting again. Uh, if you look at the old one, we do actually have fog in it, but it has this really strange look where it's lifting everything up like what you think fog would do, um, but it never really behaves like fog. So the only way we can get it to look like this is, um, is by breaking it. So I exceed the fog limits, what it's supposed to do, uh, and then we finally get this look but um, what it also means is the lighting does explode. <laughs> so, so what I mean explode is that the, 
uh, whenever we cr over crank the fog and we have an HDI map using uh, those two in combination, breaking fog and HDI, uh, the lighting will just blow up, meaning it will just get really extremely bright and it will break. So yeah, yeah that's the situation we're in, but yeah. What's up, um, Elvira? Hey, Elvira. So uh, a few questions here. What specs of the machine? What specs? I don't, I don't think we even know. I think I have a, an older card, I think a 20, something 2080 2080 and tran has the 3090 yeah i have 3090 i have an, an alienware i just uh we just buy the best alienwares at the time that we buy a computer yeah well and also because uh i wanted the 3090 and at the time you couldn't get a card that wasn't crazy overpriced so because of the crypto stuff now is yeah. the best time to buy a graphics card yeah if you guys want to buy a graphics card you can get it at the price it's supposed to be now <laughs> so. yeah buy it before uh, crypto, crypto goes, goes back, back up. goes back up yeah um but it's not any like special hyped up computer no it's literally uh just a gaming gaming machine but yeah you could see um oh, i would never use a laptop for this i i would not be comfortable we have desktop pcs yeah so you could see they've changed pretty dramatically it's in particular these shots here Like if you compare them to the old one and this is like this is our second version of the lighting so this is we're now in our third redo of the scene so it's completely changed a bunch like you can see this right here it's completely different um that means throwing everything out so if you look at like a lot of the first episodes of this thing we're doing all this art direction on on this environment, everything was completely just thrown up, thrown out. So, yeah, um, it's not a linear line to get to the end. Not for us anyway. It usually, this always happens to us. Is the first stuff we do, we always have to come back and redo it. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, and we just didn't. I'm baffled by lighting in this program. <laughs> it's so different. Like if you um, because. Just if you're new, our background is more uh, rendering, not real time, right? So we don't have a, a game background or a long history in using Unreal. We've always used Maya and um, V-Ray. V-Ray, and you know that's what the film industry was using or whatever renderer. Um, but those are all similar pipelines. And then when you light, it's actually a lot easier to light. Uh, well, there's, it's very different. It's easier and unreal to light because you see everything right away. So had we been trying to do this in all in Maya with a renderer, it would take a lot longer because uh, just to get feedback on lighting, like you would change the light and then you wait, you wait like 10 minutes. Um, and unreal, it's immediate, but it's not easy. So like in V-Ray, you can just put a light, turn on fog, and it looks really amazing. It always looks, it's very accurate. It, it, it's very realistic and close to real life. Um, where Unreal is not really like that. You have to know what you want it to do, but you don't really get good lighting for free. So that was a struggle. There's a question whether you could use Unreal 5 instead of Maya. No. Uh, Maya. Could, yeah. Maya is a crucial part. Like I see them as different things. One is like a refrigerator and the other one is an oven. They're like different. Yeah, so our our rigs are done in Maya and um, any modeling we need to do is done in Maya. So we still have to do, you know, all that stuff. Just like we you wouldn't texture in Unreal. So, um, and we use it to help process our Alembics and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that we can't do all in Unreal. I really like how the eyes look on this shot in particular. They look super glossy. This shot is, is just a still right now, but it would be a push in. This, this shot it has to be completely redone. It's just like a leftover from the old sequence. So what I want to do here, I need to add more detail here. We want to have like moving um, this red liquid, having it animating here. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to do that yesterday in um, Bifrost, which I know how to do, but it just it takes a while to, to get it 
to be right. One of the things we, we really notice is if we keep, we have to, we have to learn Houdini. I think it's <laughs> yeah, I think so too. We have to learn Houdini. It's becoming more and more obvious. Uh, but anyway, we have to up-res this. But what I want to do here is there's a, sh right here, I zoomed in here. So this is like an optical zoom, meaning I'm, I'm zooming in much closer than it should be. So it looks a little soft. But this is, she, she goes into a trance here. But what I want to do is as she blinks here, as her, she opens her eyes, the lighting changes completely. And I want everything to start looking more like um, Mar like a Mario Bava scene. I'll show you um, what this looks like. So Mario Bava is a cinema, not a cinematographer. Well, he was a cinematographer, actually. But he was a, he's a director that I really like. Um, he was one of the most influential uh, directors. And his use of lighting is just incredible. Um, really theatrical, right? Very over the top. But I, I've always loved his use of color. Um, everyone rips him off now. Um, so we want the colors to be more dramatic like this when she comes out of the trance or when she goes into the trance rather. But uh, I want it to feel like this while she's in that trance, feel really colorful. And then when she, when the father blows the horn, she'll snap back out of it. So yeah, so that's the plan here. We actually did some mocap where she goes like into a hardcore like a uh, possession here. I think this might be it here. Yeah, like this. You can see we recorded this this week. And it was just too much. Yeah, it was over the top, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it so is. we decided not to use it. Actually, it will show you guys this Give me one second. so this is this is how we record our mocap so this is literally right here to the side that's our actress Caitlin yeah, so you can see like the stuff right behind me, right there. Your house is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, we have a weird place. Got it. But yeah, you can see we just do the mocap here in the living room. So, yeah. So this is one of the things we recorded. I thought it would look really cool if she got like really possessed. But once we put it in there uh, with the stuff that happens at the end of the story, it just doesn't work. This, however, I really like this reaction here. So I probably will keep this part here. Right here. And she runs away from this thing. So that I really like, so we'll keep that. Um, you know, we have to do some more cleanup on the, the hands there. But so this is pretty raw mocap. It looks pretty damn good. So uh, one of the things that we did this week, which we had never done before, is record the motion capture of the face and the body simultaneously. So. Give me one second. Let's see. Um, so we'd never done that. We always separated the two. And most of it has to do with the fact that since this is in Swahili, our cast is in Tanzania, so we can't record their faces and, their, and the mocap together. But this week, since it was all performance stuff, meaning no, dot, meaning no dialogue, uh, we were able to do it. The thing that we found difficult, though, is when you do that, there is no syncing of the facial stuff and the body stuff because they're recorded on two completely different programs. 
So what we ended up having to do was find a system. I don't think I even have it on this one, but uh, where she would clap and blink very hard at the same time. Let me open one that I know has it. Because this is a good um, thing to show how we synced it up for. Um, and thank goodness she's really great and coordinated. <laughs> uh, this is super dependent on our actress. Yeah. I think this is it here. And this is um, not cleaned up yet, but you'll see what I mean. So the idea is you, she would clap and blink very hard, and that way I would be able to know how to align the two performances together. And I might be off by a few frames, but it, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, so this is one right here. Let me see if I can bring this back to zero. Oh, I can't. But yeah, anyway, this is another one. But yeah, anyway, that's what we had to do. I don't have a scene file with it, and it will take too long for me to, to find it. But yeah, that's that. That's what we did this week. Um, Twenty. We would never do 60 frames per second, so 24 frames per second. Yeah, we actually dislike the look of um, frame rates higher than 24 because they don't look as filmic. Right? Yeah. yeah. They look sharper or whatever, but we like motion blur. Yeah. So, so yeah, so Tran is going to show how she set up this really cool um, entrance way. We didn't have this for a while, and I just felt like something was missing here. So I did a little sketch showing, like, how this thing has to look, and Tran went in and made it look really kick-ass. So, Tran, do you want to? Yeah, I'll take over. Uh... Okay, well, I took over the whole screen. That's fine. <laughs> okay, so um, what did I do this week? Well, aside from shooting, I uh, struggled with the shot. So one of the things that makes this beginning sequence in our story really difficult is that there are a lot of wide shots that are one-offs, um, whereas a lot of our other sequences might have like one uh, kind of establishing shot that's supposed to look nice. Um, this one, this sequence in particular, has multiple shots, which makes it really hard because that's like a lot of work to try to figure out each shot. Um, and then what we did here is we, well, we had these trees um, as part of our design. So I'm going to go over that. But I just want to show you what I was working on, which is this one here. Um, it's not an animated shot yet. And then I was also trying to let me load this sequence here, which is going to take a moment. Uh, I'll just skip over. Oh, let's see. Maybe it's coming in. Um, anytime I load a sequence that has an Alembic file in it, it is slow. Yeah, Alembics need uh, some some help. Some, some help in Unreal still. Yeah, so that shot that Miguel had grayed out, I started framing it for lighting. But there, there are problems with um, the performance a little bit. I'm not even sure where the hell she's looking, but the lighting would be something like this. So she would see the other shot first of the trees that you just saw, and then she would step forward um, and then see the cape, the master cape pit shot. So um, at least if I have some lighting blocked out here, we'll probably replace this performance, but that will probably help move things, some things along. So that's what I have here. Now, um, the tree, and this, this is one of the trees. This is probably the most hero tree. Um, was created in Speed Tree. And I've talked about Speed Tree, but I've never really demoed it. So I think today I'll just kind of show you how you can customize your own trees. Um, I made quite a few trees uh, for this project. And I threw most of them away because <laughs> they didn't really work. Um, I was experimenting with different styles. And now we kind of sort of went back to a more naturalistic style. But... It's still obviously not very natural because, you know, what tree is shaped like this? Um, question. 
here is this project, a two-man army, um, primarily, but we do have amazing people helping us. So Miguel and I are doing the bulk of the hours uh, because it's our project, but we had some really talented people. We have um, some amazing animators. Um, I know we have some that graduate Nomen or about to graduate Nomen. Oh, they all graduated. They all graduate. Okay, so they're helping us, um, and they're awesome. Uh, we had Chris do the face shapes, and we had one rigger. Chris Bostjanik. Yeah, Chris Bostjanik. Uh, Chris Bostjanik is the third amigo. He helped us a lot on the on the Nino. He's really uh, incredible. And yeah, we just have really small, small, small team. And the the people helping us are really amazing at what they're doing. Um, you know, it's just still we are doing the majority of the hours because it's you know it's our project and. That's how it works when you do these type of things. So anyway, let's jump forward um, into how I, I made this tree. So if you can see speed tree over here uh, in this graph here, it's a node graph, right? Um, and you can control how these are gonna grow. I'm just gonna do this in a new scene though, because I think it'll be a lot easier. So if you open up speed tree, you'll have a scene like this, um, and then you'll have your node graph here. So you can just right click, add geometry, and you can create, you know, whatever it is you want to make. The first thing you should make though is probably a trunk, just so you can have something to grow out of. Um, you can create a regular trunk like this, right? Or what I generally prefer is I will create a trunk tube, which really has no, uh, nothing going on for it. But um, it just means that it's stripped of all, all the functions. So if you have something like this, um, over here is a little bit messy, but you can get through it. Uh, I can go over to my spine. I can adjust the height, right? So it's, it's a procedural modeling program done by NodeGraph. Now, if I want to break it up, um, I can give it late noise. So just doing something like this here will already start breaking up my tree and I can change the frequency of it, right? Obviously, I don't want this strong. Um, and it does take a little bit of work to get this to look nice, but it's not so difficult. Uh, I can go over to skin. I can make this fatter. You also have this graph here, right? So over here, the first point is my root, and this is my tip. So if I have this the same, it will be one continuous uh, width. So I can adjust this. I can also add points here. So I can say, no, I want it really fat here. So depending on what the tree shape you want to make, you can really um, adjust that. Now, if you want more control or details, you can add displacements, right? So I'm going to apply displacement. And let's just check my mesh. OK, so this is what my mesh looks like. I go over to View, go over to Scribed, um, and I'll get something like this. So you know, obviously the displacement, at least to me, it's obvious, uh, is going to be limited by the geometry. So when I'm doing um, those trees, I actually want to increase it. So if I go over my segments, I can increase my length. So this gives me some more subdivisions. You also have radial, right? And that's going to give me more detail. So now if I come back over to my displacement setting here, um, I could adjust my fine detail, you know, and I can just get something like this, which just doesn't really look amazing. Um, it does take time, right? You can also add a twist. Let's give it a mount here. Give me kind of this twisting motion. Uh, let's go back here and not make this so ugly. Reduce my fine. You can also adjust my scale. And then I can get something like that, right? Now, if I want to add, say, trunks, or not trunks, but branches, you can just select um, this node here, right-click, and then I can pick whatever I want. I can add big branches. Um, I can also add, what I usually start with is branch tubes. Um, and again, I always start with this because they're completely stripped out of any data. If you start with something like uh, big branches, 
they are basically the same, all the same thing. It's just that there's already parameters set up, right? And if I want to remove them, sometimes they're more difficult to uh, remove than to actually, you know, just start from scratch. Now, you know, I can keep going and add twigs. You know, I can even duplicate this, control C, control V, have that grow out. Um, you know, I can say I like this and throw it in here. So now in this branch here, I have two generators, this twig, well, they're the same right now, um, and this twig here, and I can adjust the frequency, okay? I'll go over how I actually made mine. Let me just delete this. Um, what I did differently was with the trunk. So there's a tool in here called hand drawing, which allows you to actually control it. Um, look at the comments. Yeah, some of my stuff looks pretty funny. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, you can export this to 3D Max. I usually export it and you can export as a FBX or OBJ. You can um, export with Win. Uh, if you get the speed tree version of Unreal, you can export it directly into Unreal with Win animation. And I covered that like not last week, but um, a couple weeks before. Now, in order for me to actually, let me move forward, um, get this here, what I did was a different tool. It's called hand drawing. This one's a little funky. So I will say one thing, this tool is amazing. It's a little bit clunky though, um, and you just have to be patient with it. Now, if I hold my mouse over here and I hold down the space bar, and then I left click while I have mouse down and I drag up, I'll get something like this. And now you see this is trunk, um, except that it has a hand icon. So this is a different mode than if I go in and I reach into here and say trunk tube and all that stuff. Um, these are not hand drawn. I mean, I, you could access hand drawn like this, but this is how I do it. Now, if that, now let's say I want to change this. I can do a couple of things. I have to hold spacebar down uh, and I hover over it and I see this diamond. Um, and if I drag this diamond, I can actually draw this, right? I don't really like doing it this way because my hand's not very steady. So I usually get too many wobbles and too many points and I want to change my mind. So um, you can do this, you know, the technique is up to you. And let's say you want to edit it after the point, you can move these points like this. Okay, and I can change it. Now, I don't like doing that. This is what I like to do is I'll usually just go, okay, um, let's say I want to make that C-shaped tree. I know my N is over here. If I have a point active and I click on it, this window over here changes properties. And it says I can add, it says add control point. I could add before, after. I'm going to add before, and it gives me a point here. And then I can take this and I can adjust this. And it also comes with this curve. So I can adjust all this here and this here, and it gives me that shape. And then here, let's point this down. And it's pointing a little weird, so I can adjust the shape. So my tree over here was basically made, you go over here, with just a couple points. I think it crashed. Okay, I'm just gonna ignore that one. <laughs> Um, it's kind of a heavy tree because all the stuff I put on top of it afterward. So I just quickly got out of it because, yeah, I don't think you guys want to see it frozen. Okay, so now I have a shape like this. Now I can go back here to my generators and the, the my attributes. And the one that I use the most is spine or skin. So skin usually um, handles properties such as width. I have my radius here, right? So I can make this fatter but I do want my tip to be more narrow. So again, this is my root always uh, over here and this is my tip. So let's just say I wanna do something like that. Now, I did probably you know, add a few points like this. If I double click a point, it turns into a curve like that. So this was just to give it some breakup, okay? And then what I also did here, um, 
is the weight under spine. So spine will usually control length properties, and it would also control um, some of the noise I can get in here. So I'm applying some noise. The frequency is high. So I'm going to change that. And then I'm going to reduce the strength. I also have this graph here where it's saying not to add a lot of noise at the root and a, a bunch at the tip. So I can kind of make it more even. And I do want to just so that I can get more breakup. And I don't want it to be this strong. I just want it not to be perfect. Okay. Now the other problem I'm probably having is just the wireframe is not detailed enough for to support all the things I want to do. So I'll go over to segments again, give it more cuts and a little bit more on the radial, which is uh, the circumference of it. And then I think that's enough. And let's just go back to my spine. I'm going to try not to make this ugly as best as I can. Let's go over to the displacement. Um, usually when I try to demonstrate, I'm talking, it turns out kind of ugly. <laughs> so let's give it this. And I can twist this a little bit. So I did give it a twist. So it feels like the tree is twisting around. And again here. Let's adjust this. And let's not apply so much towards the tip of my tree because it looks really twisted. And I think I'm going to go back to skin here. Um, I could delete these points and let the tree just really taper. Okay, so now I kind of have my hook tree. I can always go back here. Um, after I apply the noise, it kind of changes it, which is what I want so that it's not so perfect, right? Now let's say I want to add a texture. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Reality is not perfect, so we're trying to create something not perfect for create reality. Well, this obviously doesn't exist, <laughs> so um, there aren't really trees like this, but I do want to make it feel believable. Okay, so let's just say I have this, and let's say I want to add a material. So you'll have a window here, it says materials. I can hit plus minus button, and I'm going to add new, double click, I'll call this bark. And what you can do are just, is just load up these maps. Uh, what I'm doing right now is just copying this path because I don't remember that. And if you want to load up maps, you can just click on the window that's empty like this. I'll go to my native dialog or window. Let's load up this here. I'm going to load up the normal. Okay. And I think I'll just leave um, the others alone. It's not important for me to actually have everything accurate in here because all this gets reassigned to uh, in Unreal anyway. I just need a visual. Now, if I want to drop it on, I can just use this hand, click on it, and drag it on top of the node. And I'll just replace the branch material. And now I see something like that. OK, so the gloss is really glossy. So let's put this back lower. Um, this looks all right, actually. One thing that does happen here, um, let's say I want to adjust the way this is tiled. And I'll talk about that. Uh, if I go under UV mapping, I can change um, how this is tiled. So here I have U and V. So now it looks a little bit finer, right? So I added two, three. Now, let's say I want this level, um, and it actually looks OK. What can happen is the patterns start really tiling, and I can see it right here. So if you see this line 
here it's repeating over and over. So we're starting to see the repetition in this tileable texture. So this is a mega scan texture, and this is just a sample, and it's tileable, so there's no seams. Um, you can get around this by doing a couple of things. This is what I do. I tend to twist my UVs. So by twisting it, it will twirl it, and it kind of hides it a little bit, right? Now, this works with my tree because it's kind of twisted anyway. So you have to be kind of careful with any tree that is not supposed to be twisted and don't over twist it. You know, and I could twist it the other direction, which I think will look a little bit better. Okay, so now I'm getting this twisted type of texture. Um, if I really wanted this tree to be really hero or really close up like this, I'd probably, you know, you'd probably have to bring this into ZBrush. So you could just do a tree like this and bring it into ZBrush and sculpt on top of it afterward. Um, I still think it's easier than doing it all from scratch in any modeling program. Now I'm going to right click here and this time I'm going to add branch tubes. Okay, so I put the branch tubes on and they look really funny because they, you know, look like this. So let's fix a couple of things. Um, let's go on the spine where the length is and I'm going to bring this down. Okay. And let's just fix other things here. So, and we'll also go over some of the properties. So frequency, and these don't really apply to trunks because trunk is a single trunk, whereas branches are not usually single branches, right? Um, under generation, you'll have frequency control. So I can control the frequency. You also have count. Uh, if I look at this cross section, you can say, you can see that there's three branches, one here, two, and three. So if I want to change this, um, you know, right now it's at two. So two and one kind of get stuck, right? I'll leave it at three. Um, let's say I want to reduce my frequency. And I want to break how procedural, or they look like antenna, how that looks. I can spread them apart so they're not lined up. But if we look here, you can see that these are lined up. Uh, we can take care of that by spiraling these. So I'm twisting them away, giving them a spiral, and then I'm spreading them apart. Okay, and I can also lower the frequency, which will give me less. So that helps already a little bit. Um, let's go under, well, before we go out, actually. Let's just say here, if you look at my trees here, you can see I don't really have branches at this bottom part. So um, let's say I want to get rid, you know, from this point down here, I don't want any branches growing. So you actually can control that by your boundaries. So you have first and last. So first is basically your root, right? Right now the value says 0.2. If I set it to zero, it will start growing from the root zero. Um, and then the last one is 0.9. So it stops around here, which is probably 0.9. If I set it to one, it's letting it grow all the way from the base here all the way to the end. So let's just say, uh, first, I don't really want to grow it to the end. So 0.9 might work. And then from here, I don't want it to grow about halfway up. So I can try like 0.4. And you can see it knocks up um, 0.4, basically 40%, right? So 40% the way up, there will be no branches growing. Um, none of this, I think, is too difficult. It's only... The interface makes it a little bit tricky to see. But once you kind of understand, like, okay, I know what this does. It's not so hard. Now, let's say I don't want all my branches straight like this. So I can change my start angle. Right? And here, I also want to start um, breaking up. Let's give it more length, actually. So there's a couple of things I want. I want more length, but I don't want the branches at the, the top of my tree, the tip of my tree, to be as long. And I can control this graph here. So again, this is always root, and this one over here is tip. So if I do this, notice how everything's kind of shrinking, except uh, my tip is shrinking faster. So I can say from here, the branches are longer. 
And then I can say these branches are shorter, which I think looks better. Now let's give it some noise. Okay. So it will break it up. Again, the noise is applied more towards the tip. And let's say I want to apply it more towards my most of my tree. I probably don't want to apply it to my root so much because sometimes it looks funny to start it at the root. And then I also have this feature called um, early noise. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, students, you were lucky to have you teach it. Explain to them in that detail. Well, um, I do try to explain best as I can. I also do mentoring with students. So I work a lot one-on-one -on -one with students. So you, Noman has a program like that. And um, there's multiple teachers that are really good at what they do. And you can get one-on-one -on -one time with any teacher on the project um, at the school. And it's just, it's an amazing part of the program. Whereas a mentorship um, on your personal project or your assignments or any help that you need. So I think it's, I've never had any other school having that. So it's, I think it's incredible. Okay, so let's just say I have this. Now I have the branches. And then notice here how ugly that looks, right? So if I go over to skin, I can enable welding. And what that does is it just makes it look blended in. Um, it's still a separate piece of geometry. But what that gives me is this extra little mesh here. And it also blends the textures in uh, to a certain extent. And it does it pretty well, right? I mean, I think it looks pretty good. Um, now let's just say this is okay. Let's go back to spine here. And let's say I wanna add early noise. So I had late noise, early noise. Um, early noise is like Tim Burton stuff, if you guys know Tim Burton. So you can use it. It does give you kind of breakup. I don't really want this look though. It's pretty good for vines. So you can do um, vines, curly vines, things like that with that feature, which I think is nice. I just want to get a little bit. Now, I also want to add, um, let's say I really like this. I can duplicate this. And even though it says branch, you can grow off from it, right? So I can add that. And I can say maybe this starts a little bit earlier at 0.3, and now I have more branches. And it's a really fast way uh, just to get more, more stuff. And then I can keep going. I can also come back here um, and look at this. So I had my tree trunk. I had my big branches, which were actually much thinner. And these branches here, and then you can see the grouping. And these are all just like noise until you get thinner and thinner and thinner. I could borrow one. I could copy this from another file, and I can paste it here. At least I thought I copied it. Control C. Oh, there it is here. And I can drop it in here like that. And again, these are the same thing. They just basically have different lengths and noises applied to that. Uh, let's come back to this one where it's fat. And I can reduce the width. Say something like that. Now, I'm gonna introduce something else that is gonna make this um, more interesting. Let's just copy this and paste that. Actually, this is looking ugly, <laughs> so I'm just trying not to make it look ugly. Um, let's say I have, you can see that the tree branches are just doing whatever. Um, if you look at this here, I have a bunch of forces. So let me show you what that does. So let's just say um, I want my branches to kind of follow this arc. I can do a couple of things. I can click on this magnet icon and add whatever force I want. Um, I have direction, planar, and all different stuff. Direction is pretty easy to understand, so let's just make this one. And then I end up with the arrow like this, right? Now, let's say I want some of my branches to kind of go in this direction. Um, when you create this, by default, it should be enabled. 
Now, it's not actually applying this force. This is called a force. Uh, you have to turn it on. So let's say I want to apply it to this, and I want uh, this node to follow this force. I can just select this node, check on under force direction, and you can see it's trying to follow the direction now. And if I rotate this, it will just follow that direction. Right? So that's pretty cool. Now you can also adjust the strength. So right now this is 0.25. And you also have uh, the effect is not affecting the root so much. So I can say, you know what, I want to affect more of the base. Or I don't want to affect the base. It depends on what you want to do, right? You can also do certain things too, if you really want to, um, oh, let's see, Elvira. Um, Elvira was one of the best students that's ever that I've ever worked with at no one. <laughs> Just so you guys know, you guys should check out her work. It's actually really amazing. So let me come back here. Let's say you want to go crazy. You can even do something like this. So I'm going to create a magnet. Right? Um, and you can see the tree trunks are trying to follow wherever this is. OK? Now, I can also add something like an attenuation, which gives me this kind of circle. So anything within the circle is going to be affected. So you can say, like, OK, I want these branches here to come down. And you could also create, um, I can create another direction. Just add a direction. So I can have multiple directions. And I can say the branches over here, I want to go this way, right? But I'm going to add attenuation. And I want to influence. This one. So you can see now here, I have multiple forces um, shaping this tree. And I did use quite a few here to give it this shape. So it is quite art directed, right? Um, these guys kind of look sad. I can increase my frequency. Uh, they don't really have forces. You know, I could turn them on. I could say, um, I really like direction two, which is this, this arrow on this node. And you can see how that's pulling it this way. So there's a lot that you can do to really shape something how you want. Um, there's other things you can also do. So if I reach up into, I select this node, I can adjust some basic settings. They're the same here. Um, they're not separate. They're just like shortcuts, right? But this will actually adjust everything. So if I adjust the length, it's adjusting the length of all my branches. Um, if I adjust the angle, it'll do all the angles. Now, if I select node like this, what this will do is allow me just to place and control this one branch. So you can see I can slide this position. And I can also rotate it if I want. And I can also make it shorter. Or I could even delete it by hitting delete key, right? So let's just say I decide to hit delete, it's gone. Now, if I want to reset it, I can right click, clear node edits, and it will put it back to default, right? So if I have a tree that I'm happy with, um, this doesn't really look great <laughs> or anything. Um, but usually, I want to build a tree that looks great like this. And let's say I want to make variations. What I can do uh, is find the random button. And again, the hardest thing to do is to search this menu. But you just have to get used to it. Now I can hit randomize. And it will just give me variation. Um, the randomize won't work on this hand-drawn trunk because it's hand-drawn. Let's see. Let me check the thing. Looking at the messages. They want to know Elvi a link to Elvira's thing. Oh, let me plug that in. <laughs> OK, hold on. Let me see. Hello, I'm from India. I love making 3D assets for games inspired by it. My question is, how do I get entry into the game industry? What are different ways I couldn't afford to go to Nomen? Well, um, I mean, obviously, you have to learn how to, to do so many of these things. Uh, if you can't afford the whole program, there are online resources. I, um, as a teacher, I have 
a subscription to the No One Workshop, which I actually do watch. Um, and it's pretty amazing and it's cheaper. And some of the teachers actually have workshop videos on there. Um, and I'm not trying to plug, but that's the resource I use. And uh, it's really good. And I'm already a professional. And, you know, I think the information there is pretty incredible. And it's it's all professional and um, by high-end people. So I, I re kind of recommend that um, as, as a much cheaper alternative. And just really building your portfolio. Even if you can't afford that, there are tutorials on YouTube that you can use. Um, but the main thing is just to build a portfolio that looks good, right? Because they want to see examples of your work. And um, let me pull up, uh, hold on. A virus piece or her art station. You guys should really see her work. Oh, you finished that piece, Avira. Let me paste it here. So Avira went to Noman, and we had her as a student. And this is one of my all-time most favorite pieces that I've ever seen come out of this school. Um, it won grand prize on Noman Best of Term. Uh, very, very like worthy of that award. <laughs> one of the most beautiful pieces. Um, and I didn't see this one yet. This one turned out really beautiful. Yeah. So I teach, what I teach at Noman is not what I'm teaching you today. Um, that is just something on the side. What I teach are uh, one of the texture classes that deals with portrait. And this is one of the pieces that she started and then completed later. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, hey, Ricardo. So you guys should also check out Ricardo's work. He's also pretty amazing. I don't want to just sit here and plug all um, the stuff, but uh, Ricardo is a stellar, stellar artist, uh, and he's pretty kick-ass, too. Um, I'm proud of them. They're, you know, just amazing, and it's not... It's not nonsense. If you guys look yourself up, look on that, look at the work, you'll see what I mean. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so this is how we can get a tree, and this is how you can shape it, right? And then again, once I have my first tree, and I get my first tree looking real nice, it's not so hard um, to create other variations. I can go back in here, and you know, adjust them. You can see how. This is just a much better way of doing it than poly modeling it, right? It gives me all kinds of variety and diversity. Thanks, Alvaro. Um, anyway, want to show anything, Miguel? Uh, yeah. Let me jump over to my Unreal scene. And then what I'm going to do... I'm going to save. So let me get out of here. Oh, this camera. That is. So one of the things here, um, let me load a different map. I want to save this. Yeah, let's just save it. Okay, so this is this lighting here. Now, I'll show you the settings here. And this was difficult for me to light again in this in this program because it's just so different. Um, lighting is pretty basic. Let's just turn everything off. I'm, I'm kind of afraid to turn stuff off because it really does break. But if it breaks, it'll, it'll probably be a great thing because you can see it. Okay, so um, as far as like when reworking the scene, the textures were reworked. The main, but the main thing that was really reworked was the lighting. Um, let me look at this question. Uh, I don't use Cinema 4D. I just use Maya. Um, a lot of people seem to like Cinema 4D. I don't have anything against it. Maya, the reason why we use it is as part of the film industry. Everyone's using it, so it's just a standard. 
and that's why we know how to use it. I mean, here's my argument for learning for learning Maya over learning Cinema 4D. Uh, I, I hear nothing but good things about Cinema 4D, but here's the thing. Let's say you have to learn a completely new language, right? Just like literally French, Chinese, whatever, right? You could imagine what a pain in the ass it would be to learn a new language. If you're going to do that, you might as well learn a language that other people know, right? And that you could use for your career. Every company uses Maya. Only a few companies, very few companies use Cinema 4D. So why go through the hell of learning a 3D program, which is a very difficult thing. That's why I compare it to learning a language just to then say, oh my God, now I got to learn Maya anyway to get a job. If you're going to do it, you're going to go through the hell. Just do the one that's going to help you get a job. Not the yeah. one that is going to be like, okay, it's cheaper, but now I got to go learn it. I got to go learn Maya anyway. Yeah. So. They're just tools we have to know. Yeah. Um, I mean, Cinema 4D might be for like motion graphics people, but as far as for film, it's Maya. So um, every a lot of things look exciting. Blender looks exciting. You know, to me, Unreal is the most exciting. So, so that's why we're doing stuff in Unreal. It, to, it offers the most, um, I think, like it really changes things for us who are indie and just a two-man crew. This would have taken us way longer to do. Um, the downside is that we didn't know this very well and we are figuring out as we go and it's not easy. It's, there's certain things that are harder, but in general, everything can be done faster. Um, as long as you figure out how to use this program. So let me jump back into this. So you can see here, I have no lighting. Um, these are just fog carts. They have emissive on. That's why they are still visible. Let me just turn that off. So I just have an HDRI, uh, and that's just created through a backdrop, okay? And it just has one you know, out. And then I have uh, a directional light, which is linked um, as the sun. So in, under directional light, the atmosphere sunlight is on, okay? And I have a temperature on it, which makes it a little bit warmer. And it's not very intense. It does have some volumetric scattering, so it will give me some of that once I turn on fog. Uh, you can see right now it doesn't look very good. Let's turn on the fog. Okay. And you can see where I mean um, under the fog here, it's over cranked. So normally uh, this is at zero, right? And by um, default, this can only go to point zero and this can only go at point zero 0.05, which doesn't really give us much. Okay, so that doesn't really feel very foggy. I don't know what you guys think of <laughs> it. Like, like, that's fog? Okay, um, so when I exceed it, let's just undo. Right, so I set this to 1, and this is at point 0.5. I finally get more fog. Um, it does brighten my scene. A lot which is kind of different um, if I was doing this in v-ray it would become darker so and that's not something I'm used to like the response intuitively right uh, because foggy days do actually take away light if you think about it in real life they don't make your days brighter they actually reduce the light because you have more obstruction so my scene is becoming brighter and then again that's a little bit weird yeah, it looks foggy. Um, now, what I do have, I don't have on right now. It's post-process. So let's turn that on. And you can see that changes a lot. So let's just turn off what I have applied. Right, so I'm going to turn off my global settings here and my offset. I don't think this one even does anything. I don't know why that's on. Okay. So that's my color grading. Go to my lens here. Um, I set my metering roll to manual and my exposure. I do have a couple effects here under image effects. I have a vignette that I apply. Okay, and then I also have a chromatic aberration. 
which is kind of giving me this slight softening look here. And then all I have afterward, I mean, these aren't really doing as much. They kind of are affecting it. Um, then I go into my global settings. Let me collapse all of this. Here, I have my saturation, which kicks it up. Let's just turn it off. I bring down my gamma and I give it a contrast. Then my saturation kicks in. And what we're doing to all our look is I have in the shadows an offset, which is making it slightly more red. So on the offset, it's a very low value, um, but you can see what it does if I increase it. It just tints my shadows a little bit more red and it's in everything that we're doing right now. And so just by doing something like that, you can see how that looks. Uh, but you, I do need to post-process because when I have this much fog, you know, this is just what it does and I want that fog. So in the beginning I did fight like, okay, I put this much fog, it looks really bright. What the hell is this <laughs> weird bright scene? Uh, but I want this kind of fog. So you need to post-process to just kind of balance it back down Right, and I still have my fog. Um, and my colors are, are there, so I'm actually overcranking my saturation, like by, you know, 1.3 to get it. Uh, but the, you know, the green color is not accidental. So my exponential height fog has a blue tint. Now, as far as why um, the fog turns green, it's because my sun is yellow. So if I turn off the temperature, um, you can see my sky turns blue because that is the color of my fog in my albedo right here, right? It's inheriting this blue color. And then what happens if you put yellow and blue, you get green, right? So that's part of, you know, kind of our look. Um, I can balance it. You know, I can say I want it to be a little bit cooler. So as it's cooler, it goes back to being a cooler sun and then it makes my fog in my sky not as green. Um, if I make it warmer, well, it would just it'll kind of overpower everything. But it is a fast way to get different looks. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Max. Thanks for chiming in. Um, anyway, so this is how my, my scene is look, looking. And I'm not going to say this because I don't, I probably just broke a bunch of stuff I didn't want to break. Right. Uh, but this, you know, helps a lot. But, you know, it takes time to get used to. I will say, you know, what weirds me out is like, if I zoom out far enough, my fog is like gone. <laughs> it's gone. See, look how clear that is. So I'm not used to that. So if I were doing this in V-Ray and you're out this far, it would have been completely covered by fog, right? Just like in real life. So the fog is kind of a fake effect. Um, and at this point, I'm finally starting to understand how to deal with it. Only, you know, when it does something like this, it's not like I can just go, oh, let me just change my angle. And it's going to look good at this angle. Usually get this one angle to look nice it only works at that angle <laughs> and then when i turn it around it's just like oh it looks like uh right like see how foggy that is that's like a really foggy day and i turn this way over and i have uh clouds which is weird so if we had to do a shot like this and it was wide it would just be com um the lighting would be completely changed in order to get it to work so and that's just how it goes. Even though there's so much fog here, there's like none here. <laughs> so, uh, but you, you know, that's kind of like in real life anyway. When you're shooting, um, I mean, you can't control the sky, but you do have to add lights and and change things up. How's it going, Miguel? Good. You want to share some stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm coming up with stuff as I go, so I, I could show you stuff, but. Um... You guys yeah. are free to ask questions. 
Um, you want to show some stuff? Sure. So, like I was saying earlier, one of the things we wanted to suggest is that she's going into a trance. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of clear when her eyes roll back <laughs> and then she, she starts lifting her leg as if she's about to fall into the, the hole. Um, but I wanted to have something visual to show you that earlier on. So going back to the Mario Baba thing. I was kind of neat. Yeah, I was thinking about doing something like that, where on the blink it cuts to a completely different color palette. Um, so right now, I kind of like that. How did you do that? Just by coloring? How did I, you just, I just hit all the other lights and I just started from nothing. I rendered them as two separate shots. They're just edited as one i like the i like the color it's very clearly like she's in some different world yeah uh there's a question here can i use world creator mesh to unreal probably could well yeah the k-pit scene that i was showing um it's gaia oops i sorry i didn't mean to take over you can take over no i don't want to take over <laughs> it's your turn um, the the K fit mesh I was showing was Miguel made and Gaia, so you can get anything in there as long as you can export as a some kind of OBJ or FBX. Yeah. So so right now I'm just trying to come up with a look for for this thing. And I am just making this up as I go, so. That's kind of fun though. It doesn't have to like match anything else. <laughs> it doesn't have to match anything though. No. Yeah, and you can go kind of crazy. So the problem I have is this, like I I do kind of want to center this a little bit more, but when I do, it doesn't don't I kind of don't think it looks as good. Like I think it being slightly offset actually works better. Do you see what I mean? Like it's giving this really weird, that's overwhelming, that's too much. And even if I bring down the intensity, then it kind of loses the whole point of it. Well, it might be just the, how high is the, how intense is the light? 0. 0.4. Oh. That's kind of, yeah. So then if I bring this back up here, you see what I mean? It just kind of starts losing. Can you, um, is that directional light? Yeah. Well, that's why I'm kind of thinking that the best way is to not use that. Just ignore that and just light it with. With whatever. Like with whatever. Well, it could work because it, you know, his his lighting is like very stagey yeah so maybe putting something like this duplicating this one let's rotate this down That kind of it's kind of cool. Then let's do uh... so again. This is like our very much Mario Bava uh, homage here. He really uses like primary colors, which are pretty cool.
none of this might make it right so we're just literally just coming up with something as we go this might make it in this might not make it in we are experimenting you should put like the um the aspect ratio Um, one question here. Do people use Macs in industry? Are they an option? Everyone uses PC. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone uses Macs. Yeah. They're not powerful enough. Like, not only that, they just don't always have the full support. Like, um, I know on like Unreal 5 is DirectX 12 now and used to support um, 11, but now it's just 12. And... Um, I was on the forum like a month ago or whatever, someone complaining that Macs don't support DirectX 12. I don't know if that's changed, but you couldn't use Unreal 5 on their Mac because of that. I like Macs for, Macs are for surfing the internet and for buying your mom because she always gets viruses. <laughs> that's what Macs are for. Uh, they're just not powerful enough. I, I, I don't know like how strong their graphics cards are, but you need a really strong graphics card for a lot of programs nowadays. Like um, you need one for Unreal and you need for any kind of texturing software, basically any texturing software that you're ever gonna use. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna use, need it for a bunch of other stuff. So I like Apple products though, so I'm not against them, but I wouldn't ever work on one. I think I would cry. Yeah. I like where you're going there. Looks like hell. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty weird. So let's see what we have here. I'm going to pull up this blue a little bit more. save this just in case not just in case we, we basically crash every five minutes yeah um i don't know if it's the version of unreal that we have but uh holy moly um it saves when you crash too <laughs> so that's usually the worst it like primarily crashes when you save yeah did you show mario baba's lighting samples i'll pull up So Mario Bava, um, he's an Italian um, director. He started as a cinematographer, though, and he transitioned uh, over to directing. And he's Italian. That's not obvious by the name Mario Bava. And he created a few movies that are really influential, the most being like... Um, Black Sunday and Black Sabbath, um, very influential to the horror genre. Um, he also made this one movie called Planet of the Vampires, which is very, it's aged poorly in terms, because it's a sci-fi. So his horror movies aged the best because they required the, le the least special effects, of course. But Planet of the Vampires is essentially the movie Aliens, or Alien, I should say. The exact same concept, but done in 1965. Um, and his lighting, you could see, it's very much reds and blues, reds and blues, purples and reds. And uh, I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, I actually recently just bought a bunch of the ones that I was missing, uh, like Baron of Blood and uh, a few others. I, f I forget the name. Some of the names are pretty long. Um, but... Uh, I haven't gotten them yet, but I, I have a bunch of his stuff. Arrow has a lot of his movies. Um, a Bay of Blood is one of the ones he did, which is basically, um, what is that, the Jason series? What's the official name? Uh, Friday, the 13th. Friday the 13th. It's basically just a ripoff of Bay of Blood. Um, but the intro in particular to uh, Black uh, Friday, Black Sunday, 
is just uh, Black Friday. <laughs> black Sunday is just incredible. It's it's beautiful. This one is actually in black and white, but it's it's just really gorgeous. And I just love the colors on his stuff. Again, just the red and the, and the blues. Um, it's got this vintage uh, Technicolor look to it that I just really love. So it's very theatrical, of course. Nowhere in the world are things lit like this, right? It's very, very theatrical, but I kind of love that about it. So if you, like Tim Burton is inspired big time for this. Um, Crimson Peak, big time inspired by this. You could see it in the, in the color palette, even on the, the poster. So pretty awesome. So I wanted something that feels more like a Mario Bava thing. Um, and again, I'm not saying we're, we're, we're going to use this. This is an idea that we had last night and uh, we're looking into it. So the idea was to use this as a transition. So she goes from there and boom, we cut to something much more supernatural. We would replace this. And I, I really like how that this looks here. So, uh, you know, I hesitate to change this because I do love that. And this, the horns here coming out of her head, I hope that's pretty clear. That's intentional, of course. But um, I think it's nice if you change it, like where you're taking it. Like, I really like the. Um, this here? Well, I like where you're starting to go with it. Yeah, it's not, it's not fully there yet. If you could get it more symmetrical, it would look cool. As a whole, though. Um, let's find the camera for this. Uh, we're supposed to be done as soon as possible. So. Yeah, we're late. Yeah. Um, part of the reason why is. Well, if you saw the stuff that Miguel was showing you earlier, that was our old lighting. And then as we progress forward, um, probably getting the hang of like, okay, this is how you light this light in this program. Yeah. And then and then we looked back at old stuff, we're like, oh, it looks like crap. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the things so we, we didn't want to do is is rush this out just to hit the deadline, but it looks crappy because it doesn't serve anybody. It just looks like uh it doesn't look good. Congrats, you got it done fast. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's not really a project for fun. Um, <laughs> it's a personal indie project. I guess that's what you call uh, an indie project, which is something you want to do. Uh, we do have deadlines. We just have some flexibility. Because most of it is not really that fun. <laughs> Sorry. I would say it's like fun 5% of the time. It's fun when it's done. Yeah, it's only fun when you're done. Uh, but most of the time it's overwhelming and tiring, frustrating. Yeah. All right, let me find this light here. So it's not that um, are we going to show it in I would. I would hope so. So... Are you going to visit? Uh, we are going to show it at Noman. So we would try to do like a, an event. Oh, that's uh, kind of neat. Can you give it that hard? I don't think I got to meet a lot of my a lot of students in the past couple of years uh, because of the pandemic. So I kind of recognize their voices, not their faces. Uh, let's see. So the intro, question about intro to Maya. It's a great class. 
I used to teach that class. Uh, planning to take the intro to Maya online thoughts. Uh, what level would you be after taking that? It depends how much time you put into it. Yeah, you used to teach that class, but you don't anymore. Yeah, I don't anymore. Uh, I like teaching that class, though, because that's where you could really um, kind of hook the people on to get them excited about it. It's the make or break class. Like people either go, okay, this is what I'm going to do, or they say, okay, this is not for me. So that's why I like it, because I feel like you can make a difference based on how you teach it. Yeah. Um, there's multiple teachers, but... There's some great, great work that comes out of that class. Um, I don't know the curriculum well, but I've seen some samples of work. I think you do like seeing, um, get, getting into the basics of how to, you know, work in Maya, how to do some basic modeling. It's not super in depth. That's what, that's because, you know, it's intro to Maya, but uh, you get whatever you put into it. So if you work really hard in it, you will get nice results. Uh, but every Millman student does take that class. Yeah. Because it's well, obviously required. And you should take it no matter what, even if you feel like, uh, oh, I know Maya a little bit, just still take it. Um, I remember when I went to Noman, because I was a student there. We were both students there. I, my first thought was like, oh, I, I've played around with, with Maya a little bit. I, I don't need to take this. That would have been like the worst mistake of my life because you don't know crap right i didn't know crap is what i really should say but like i thought i did and then when you learn unreal to maya properly you're like uh oh my god if you would have gotten the fundamentals wrong or missed that it would have been a disaster so i highly recommend everyone takes it even if they feel like they already know maya yeah i think it's a very good foundation um that's not it i'm new to question here i'm new to unreal but for lighting are you creating different light setups setups for each shot and if so the separate with sequencer yes um for the most part yeah so for some shots so um if it's really dramatic for most shots it's like okay you have a scene and then you have the lighting set up, like say the, the introduction shots where the girls are just talking. It's basically the same light, right? And then in the sequencer, you might toss the light in there and just change the, the rotation or the angle of the light, and that's it. Um, and then that's just being controlled in, in the sequencer. For scenes that use a lot of fog, I usually just set, duplicate the level um, because the fog will break the lighting which means it makes it unstable, and kind of wig out. And I usually don't want that to affect any of the other sequences. So if I destroy something in that one level, it's fine because I didn't screw up the other stuff. Um, if it feels different enough, I would just duplicate the map and just have it be that shot. But all the dialogue stuff, uh, close up on the characters are usually all done in the same map, um, it just changing the light slightly. Yeah. Um, other question. For 3D modeling, do you need to learn ZBrush as well, or can you just download characters and pose them? Because at the end of the day, I want to create animation character poses. Well, if you're just interested in animation, then it doesn't make sense for you to really master ZBrush or anything like that. So um, if you were a student that wanted to be a modeler, then you can't just download models. But if you're someone who wants to specialize in animation, then that, you know, then of course you can download models because then your work would just be um, focused on animation. So it depends what you're specializing in. Um, I don't think you need to master ZBrush if you're applying to be a character animator. Uh, also, you have a question, Miguel. What's the question? 
Also, Miguel, is there any work that you saw from students who came in without knowing nothing and were like, oh, this is good? Yeah, totally. Yeah. All the time. Um, yeah, there is some amazing work for incoming students that just apply. You know, sometimes they already have experience um, somewhere else, or it's not uncommon for, sto uh, for Noman students to actually attend and have already a degree somewhere else, and they are doing their second education at Noman. And I have quite, I don't know, talked to quite a few students like that. So, or sometimes they'll come in like really amazing background painting, just don't know 3D very well. And then their portfolio is awesome because they are great painters already. So yeah, so we're just trying to make this look again more, what's the word I'm looking for, trend? Theatrical, stylistic. Yeah, all of those. What's a light in the K-pit? What is it? Yeah, is there a separate light there? There's two lights. There's that one, there's that one, there's that one. I kind of like it. Like that. Just I think, like this? Well, I think the light in the K-pit is overpowering. Maybe you can have it, but just tone it down. Just, it just, down. just enough to pull out her silhouette, and that's it. And you could probably you could probably give her a stronger rim. You can see this is how we work all day long. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, that looks better. And then I think maybe you should just toss another light on the other other side. Of the on the right just to even out the thing on the right yeah because you're or you're, the left uh you're all right <laughs> camera right okay here yeah how come like how do you get that light shape to be more even which light shape um the red light like be that glow be behind mm -hmm. like the shape of it is asymmetrical behind yeah Let's get that. It's that glow that's hitting the sky. So it's not that light. That's probably the directional light. Yeah, that's the directional light. So let me try to adjust that. Yeah, that's better. Kind of like it where you just had it a second ago. Like that. And if you want the glow to spread, why not just bring up the volumetric scattering or something? I think that's how it is. Um, last question. Uh, do I work one-on-one -on -one with students? Is that online students as well, whom you're taking intro to Maya? Um, no, only on campus. I, I do work on one-to-one -one students. I usually never work on with online students. Uh, I'm not sure how that, how that works. Uh, but I'm usually only... Well, I do it all the time, one-on-one. -on -one. So I teach classes, and then I do, again, mentoring. Um, and I try to help students out one-on-one. -on -one. But usually that's um, on-campus thing. Yeah. I usually don't teach online, so I don't usually have contact. Because no one has you know, a lot of teachers, a lot of students. And I don't know every single student. That looks nicer. Yeah. We'll see if it works. 
and we a lot of the times when we're doing this especially something like this we're like this could either work or this can totally not work or just look bad <laughs> but usually things that we do that we're proud of are things that we thought were never going to work um our k pit shot which is uh the shot i was breaking down the lighting um took a couple of tries a lot of tries yeah well for for different reasons um the first try was just the first try and then um and then when we started you know start using unreal it, it, we didn't have the, the full release yet so we kept updating um, and then every time we update unreal it would break our lighting in our scene so then our lighting would ha always have to be redone so we were kind of redoing the lighting yeah and i feel every time we redid it it got worse and worse yeah it did get <laughs> worse actually it totally got worse um so we kept redoing it but kind of not because we wanted to, because we updated and the light would break. And then finally, we just said, we're not going to update anymore because we can't do this. And um, this last try was actually trying to relight it to look better, not just trying to fix something that broke. Yeah. Um, Adam Lab, we totally appreciate your presence. In, in the chat and watching the stream. So you are always more welcome to come next week and the week after. So I wanna put this in the in the edit, even if I'm not done, just to see what it what it's gonna look like. I agree. So save. first thing is save, yeah. Cause this thing, like we've been saying, crashes all the time. So it's going to take a moment, but we'll render this out and see what it looks like uh, in the edit. I probably should have just lowered the sample settings. But um, yeah. So you can see it looks really over cranked at the bottom and the top, but there's going to be um, Is it our did, matte lines. Did the bottom light get over cranked? No, it's the, I think it's the matte lines. You think so? Looks like it blew up. Well, Let's see. yeah. It's rendering fairly quick, so. We shall see. Um, if anybody has any questions, now's a good time. So you can see it is real time, but it's not really fully real time. Like it still takes a few minutes. So it's saying it's gonna take about four and a half minutes to finish this. So again, four and a half minutes for 120 frames to even complain about it is, is crazy, but it is not 100% real time. Um, well, you could, but then it would look crappy. Like yeah. it, it would have artifacts and yeah, and all that, all that stuff. So, um, but we're happy with being able to have the option to increase the quality during render. Yeah. So yeah, it does look like it. It might be a little too bright, but again, it's fine. We're just gonna test it out and see. This is by no means we're gonna nail this right away. Like I like it, but I'm totally not in love with it. So I'm probably gonna try a bunch of different. Uh, configurations it'll still be the red and the blue but um, let's take a look at this in the meantime so okay 
And, you know, we are using a lot of red and blue in the beginning here. It's a very different type of red and blue, but I don't think it'll feel so odd. We have to change the, the ground on this one here where the little guy gets killed. Ni mawindo yangu, ulichelewa tena. But you can see there is a lot of red and blue, so it's not so crazy to make the colors that way. It actually kind of is cool. There were it, it is those colors because I like it. Yeah. I think it's I think it looks nice. I think we're also um, pretty careful about the temperature of the blue. If you notice that it's kind of more of a teal blue, and Here. Then, yeah, well, in general, um, well, not the one the one that I just these are like it's becoming super, it's superman blue yeah so it's a very different blue it's like that blue that he's using usually we associate more with nighttime um i don't even know if this blue is nighttime this no is, but that it's not yeah. nighttime but that temperature is yeah. associated yeah, with yeah, nighttime yeah, yeah. right it's so more subtle yeah it, it would be more subtle so like very we're very careful in beginning sequences not to use that temperature of blue or that hue Obviously not that saturated because it feels more like night. Like if you go with the city shot, it's using that temperature of blue. Yeah. Oh, another thing we did this week, we we did one more mocap on this one sequence here. There was one shot that I felt was missing, which is I felt it was important that something really triggers her before she explodes and, and comes out of here. For those of you guys that have been following this part. <laughs> So we've, uh, you, you can see kind of the red and the blues are I'll there play, also. Let it play into the city. So this is nighttime. And if you pay attention, the, the blacks are not completely black. They're a deep blue. That's the same temperature of the um, of a nighttime blue. See, that blue is more blue, whereas our daytime blue is more green. Yeah. There's our little anteater that we see get killed in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> poor little guy. So, um, so all right, let's see how this render is doing. So it looks like it's finished. So let's pop it in the edit. Again, I know it's not going to be perfect. So it's, uh, so bear with us. But let's just take a look. So Bava... There it is. I do think the colors are over cranked. However, I do know that uh, the color correction will tone that down a bit. So let's adjust this. The light did get stronger. <laughs> it did get stronger, right? Yeah. Here's another thing that you guys will notice. This is for, for those of you guys that are dealing with Alembics. This thing drove me bananas here. But you can see that on frame one, we get this. You're like, what the hell is going on here? Right? So one of the things I started doing is just deleting the first frame. That's not an efficient workflow if you already have like a certain edit that you're trying to match or whatever. And now you're like, oh, you have to delete one frame. One frame could make a big difference. Yeah, it can. Especially and if you have like 20 frames. Yeah. So you're like, what the, what the hell? What's going on? So 
what that is, I'll show you here. If you come over here, you can see this is my sequencer. And when I get to frame zero, if I move after or below frame zero, see that she jumps. Because the Olympics <laughs> do this really stupid thing where they just Yeah. They should just stay in this in the last they frame. Get, they get deformed. They so get deformed, yeah. You, you can't tell in there because she just looks smaller, but sometimes like the head shrinks and it looks like smashed in and they just look really weird. Yeah. So that's what's causing that. What you're actually seeing there is the motion blur of her between there and there. And so all, all Olympics do this. All Olympics do this. So what you have to do, select your model. There it is. Go to your animation. Go to your properties. And under pre-roll frames, just set it to like 10 and then post frame, set it to 10. So all that's going to do is it's going to say, hey, once you get below frame zero, stick with that same frame, frame zero, for 10 frames below that and, and above that. So you can see it's now snaps over here, which is frame negative 10. The negative 10 doesn't matter because frame negative nine and up it's just static so it's not it's going to make sure that there's no weird motion blur issues so super important to know this because it'll avoid uh it'll prevent that from happening so but yeah so i have to re-render that to make sure that that's yeah it's really weird why did that light get really strong i'm not sure so press, let's, the, press the play button that's, that's what i was going to say yeah Turn the bars back on. Let's come over here. It's also, yeah. Okay, so your lighting broke, which is a great example of broken lighting right there. Um, this is what happens when lighting breaks, meaning it just doesn't reflect what you see in the viewport as to what it's rendered. So how do you fix this? I don't know. Uh, how I mean, do look, I? Look, it looks, it looks better now it's still too bright but at least yeah but it's still looks. when you play it that's what it's actually rendering so miguel is hitting the play button and that's the result you actually get um the way he's way you normally work in a viewport you don't have the play button on and they're supposed to actually match so when you hit play um it should look the same you so can when see the it, temperature is shifting yeah because it's reloading but that is the result when you hit the play button that's what your render looks like right yeah so that's when I keep saying lighting is breaking, lighting is breaking. Um, what happens is your it just doesn't look the same. Sometimes your viewport will snap back correctly. Um, I don't know how to get it to snap back, but it would just like it would just like go, oh okay, I'm I'm fucked up and I'll figure it out. Um, I shouldn't cuss. But um, whenever that happens, it drives me insane. So then the way I work with it is I just keep hitting play. Um, play and then I check it and I go oh okay and then eventually it will snap back <laughs> to it. it will work itself back to what it's supposed to look like and the play will actually look like the viewport um, when it's broken like that I just completely ignore that it's broken and I just keep hitting the play button um, why is it breaking it's probably because there's an H dry in in the scene and it's using a lot of fog so that's not actually as broken sometimes when you hit play the lighting looks blown out um, and that's because we're exceeding the fog, right? The fog is really strong in that scene. It is pretty strong, yeah. Yeah, so basically HDRI maps plus fog, um, breaking the fog or exceeding the fog will, will get you this problem. Yeah, Rick, so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty important. But yeah, we have to figure out this lighting thing because it's a total bummer. So here I, I, I would assume that beyond just the, the change visually from this to this, like the light almost has to change. Uh, not the light, the sound has to change. Um, you know that I've, I've slept very poorly when I can't even talk straight. And today's one of those days where I just slept very little. We were 
working on this till like five in the morning. So uh, sound would have to change. Um, I'm still not totally sure about this one. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll come. I'll have to keep working on this today. But um, the idea, you guys now know, we want this to part here, these very few frames to look really surreal and, and more magical. Um, and this is all in her head, right? So this is not really happening. So the other, the other sister would not have noticed, you know, any of this happening. Like the sky is not really changing. It's just in her trance. So that those colors would have to reflect all of these shots in all of these shots, and then they would be broken when the father calls. Okay. I think it's cool. I like I like the idea. Yeah, I think it's cool. Um, it's been used in a few movies using the blink to transition from different color. So it's not a new idea, but no idea really is. So we're we're trying to use a lot of influences from 1960s and 70s movies in this in particular. Um, so it's totally fine. But yeah, that's it. It's three. So if anybody has any questions before we go, let us know. If not, we'll see you guys next week. We'll be done with this sequence for sure by then. And then uh, we'll be moving on to yeah, the last and sequence. kind of revisiting this part is really draining for us because... I feel like we're we're treading water, like we've already done this. Well, mentally it's draining. Uh, it wears you down. And then obviously there was some there was some difficulty so far as why we didn't get to look good. So now we're confronting the problems. So yeah, and, and then trying to fix it. Yeah, but it's been it's been draining. It's the most unfun stuff to do because you feel like, oh, I've already done this before. So yeah. yeah. So no questions. So all right, guys. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, tune in next week. Um, and you can see some of the other things we've, we've, we've gotten done. These you guys have all seen. So our ceremony looks good. Our beach stuff looks good. So we're pretty happy with all of this. Uh, this is just nuts that we built all of this and it's only in one shot, but that's how it is. Um, but yeah. So thanks everybody. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, uh, Adam, uh, Elvira, Ricardo. You're still Thank you, Rick. one best to term in my eyes. With that devil shot. Still yeah, that devil piece favorite. was very nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you, guys. Ricardo. <laughs> All right, guys. So you guys take care. See, I still remember those pieces. I don't remember a lot of pieces unless I really like them. So you know I'm not lying. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.